we have sort of a couple of things we want to go through but i think we should jump to those articles that or those items that the that sort of show how the attrition is affecting Israeli society. We can yeah. come back to some of the other things if we have time. Yeah. So there is a there are a couple of um, of items. Uh, there was uh, you know a, 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 an editorial in Haaretz about um, how the startup nation um, is basically over and done with. That uh, not only have businesses. You know, tech businesses in in uh, in Israel closed um, as part of this like massive wave of business bankruptcies, um, but uh, the the tech sector is basically is basically done. Um, shut down nation. Shut down nation. Exactly. Exactly. As as Sheer Hever has said. Um, yeah. Did uh, Ali? Did you want to talk about that specifically? Um, yeah, this was actually yeah. a report in the marker, which is the sort right. of the financial and uh, business supplement of Haaretz, which is, of course, the, the you know, well-known Israeli newspaper. And the headline is, um, I think we can actually maybe even show it on screen, but the headline is that uh, it's directly tied to the war. Money has dried up and Israeli startups are folding. And it mm -hmm. starts by saying, a review by the market indicates that a string of Israeli startups have shut down or significantly reduced their activity in the past year, with the trend being even more pronounced in recent months. Uh, and then it says, it cites, uh, it says, quote, we had sales of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and we're nearing one million. We sort of had momentum, but we were unable to raise money, says Raviv Kula, a co-founder of the agritech company Fruitspec. The company's last funding round was completed in 2021 and it raised five million dollars it tried to raise another four million dollars last year but couldn't get commitments for the entire sum the funding round didn't happen and in february the company shut down and 20 employees were laid off it's directly tied to the war says cooler foreign investors disappeared and those who wanted to work together said it wasn't the time Investors in Israel who had expressed interest also decided to pull out. That's the situation in other companies too. It's very hard to raise money even in small amounts. So, you know, and they'd say that this is repeated dozens of times, if not hundreds of times. And what's interesting there, and it, it does remind me of our conversations um, in recent months with Sheer Hever, is it's not only the foreign investors who are saying, we're not going to put money into Israel now. It's Israeli investors yeah. saying we're not going to invest in yeah. Israel right now. And so you have capital flight, you have accelerating brain drain, which is was there before. I mean, this is the thing. Yeah. All of these trends were visible before October 7th. What October 7th has done is accelerated them to yeah. light speed. And just think about it. We talked, of course, remember a few weeks ago, about Intel pulling out of a $25 billion investment in uh, Israel. So I think that's this is, again, another sign in the sort of loss of confidence and the collapse in the Israeli economy, recalling, of course, that the high-tech sector, which was over, I mean, there is, there is or let's say was a high-tech sector, sector in Israel, mostly tied to the military and to Unit 8200, which we just talked about. Um, it was overhyped, but it was there. And it was always sort of the jewel in the crown for Israel. And also the thing that they bragged about most in their propaganda with the phrase startup nation. Oh, you know, look at Israel. It's this this uh, this jewel in the in the amid this sea of barbarity and we have this high tech sector and we're solving all these problems well all that has evaporated yeah yeah it's like it's very satisfying to see the startup nation becoming so called becoming a, a shutdown nation and it's it, it reminds me as well of our conversations we've had in the past with the canadian researcher um, Michael Bukerit, because he um, wrote and researched a lot about parallels between South African apartheid and Israeli apartheid. And the South African white supremacist regime 
used to sort of justify try and justify itself in the west with these similar kind of justifications right no uh, uh, anti-communism was one but also they tried to say that they were bringing sort of civilization quote unquote uh to africa in, in a similar sort of way that israel claims to be bringing civilization to the, the west asia um as if like having some sort of app like ways or whatever stuff they come up with um would justify all their crimes and all the genocide that they're carrying out but it's uh it's very satisfying to see that it's even that is overblown nonsense and it's always been overblown i remember ali you writing about it in one of your books about the sort of claims about um green technology and so forth all right. the things they've claimed to have invented are often overhyped marketing. yeah marketing or, or failures yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there is also an, uh, another uh, interesting piece, uh, again in Haaretz, the Tel Aviv Daily. This one was a, an op-ed by um, Major General Yitzhak Brick, um, talking about how Israel, he estimates, has one year left. If, uh, if, this, if this war continues, especially if it expands, but more on this, uh, yeah, the strategy of attrition. Um, Ali... <laughs> You read it. I know, John, you read it too. Yeah, um, yeah. What, what do people think about this one? Yeah, let's just, uh, I mean, we should also share a couple of paragraphs from this because yeah. it's so striking. And and um, so, again, this, this is a, actually sort of an op-ed by uh, Major General Yitzhak Brick, who is a reserve general, a well-known figure in Israel. And he says uh, that, most of the pretentious declarations made by Defense Minister of Galant throughout the war in Gaza have proven to be groundless. After the occupation of Gaza City, he said that Israel was in total control of the city and its tunnels, and within a short time, Hamas would surrender. After the occupation of Khan Yunis, he claimed that Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar was running in the tunnels by himself and had lost control of his men, and within a few days, he would be caught. With these pronouncements, Gallant, along with his colleague, IDF Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, has been throwing dust in the eyes of the Israeli public. So that's one excerpt I wanted to share where he's just completely dismissing their claims of any military success. But then he links it to what's happening within Israeli society. And so these paragraphs are really telling. He says... Israel is sinking deeper into the Gazan mud, losing more and more soldiers as they get killed or wounded, without any chance of achieving the war's main goal, bringing down Hamas. The country really is galloping towards the edge of an abyss. If the war of attrition against Hamas and Hezbollah continues, Israel will collapse within no more than a year. Terror attacks are intensifying in the West Bank and inside the country, the reservist army is voting with its feet following recurring mobilizations of combat soldiers, and the economy is crashing. Israel has also become a pariah state, prompting economic boycotts and an embargo on uh, arms shipments. And yeah, and just again, uh, Yitzhak Break is a major general in the, uh, or was a major general in the armored corps, and uh, was the commander of the IDF military co uh, colleges. So this is a very senior general who is making these prognostications. Yeah, he's not like a, an anti-Zion, you know, like he's he's not a, a peaceful uh, anti-war guy. No, he was his role as military <laughs> ombudsman for the IDF was to deal with preparedness. So yeah. he dealt with military preparedness for a decade, and he boasts about how in other interviews about how a billion dollars was spent on his research. He's researched 1,600 uh, fighting units um, and and just so this preparedness yeah. thing is isn't coming from he's he's been saying this for a long time that they're not prepared. Um, but yeah, he's he's not a, a bleeding heart. He his goal for the uh, for the war on Gaza was to to delay the ground invasion, to continue to starve the population, cut them off. That was his uh, strategy for Gaza. 
Um, and he's worried the things that he's worried about in the West Bank are interesting because he's worried about the West Bank taking up a strategy like Gaza did during the Second Intifada, where the fighters with all these IEDs that they decide to turn from defending uh, their villages with the IEDs to turn them on the settlements and make the settlements ha require significant security forces to protect them. Um, and that they just don't have in their society the ability to raise that many troops. Um, and he's very down on the ability to fight a war with Hezbollah in any form um, at all. And also to his resume, he was the commander, the northern commander, uh, the northern command chief. Um, so he spent uh, a decade uh, doing that as well. So he knows the north. He knows the fight with Hezbollah. Uh, he knows the social uh, dysfunction within his state. He knows that they're a pariah state around the world. And a war of attrition is is going to exacerbate all of those aspects. Yeah, yeah he, I mean, he's part of the security establishment, right? He's part of the security intelligence establishment as opposed to the Netanyahu political establishment, mm -hmm. which, and the former is, you know, surprisingly fairly often against the latter and we've been it, i found this article interesting because we've been seeing a, you know a series of similar predictions for a while now right and it um again it reminds me of another thing in, in one of your books early like you wrote so you, you wrote many years ago about how people didn't expect the collapse of south african apartheid to come as quickly as it did and when it did happen, it happened very, very quickly. You know, people, the the, the architects of apartheid probably thought it would last uh, forever. But when mm -hmm. it these things accelerate, it can come very quickly. And this is, you know, what we're going to see. I think I can't say if it's going to be, you know, today, tomorrow, or whenever. But when the collapse happens, I think it will happen very quickly. And again, this is something that Israeli planners have been saying for a long time. Um, again, going back to the Rayut Institute um, 15 years ago or more, they were saying in their PowerPoint, this, this Israeli think tank, influential Israeli think tank, um, talking about the collapse of um, Israel's uh, alleged uh, legitimacy in the international arena. They were explicitly comparing themselves to South Africa at the time, saying, well, the, you know, if we if we don't shore up our legitimacy in the international fora um we we could collapse sooner than we think so these these are not um unrealistic assessments by any stretch yeah those are those are really good points asa and um the what what strikes me is that that uh you know we've heard ilan pape say something yeah similar uh said hassan nasrallah says something similar uh, we say something similar and here's General Yitzhak uh, uh, Breck saying something similar. But none of us have dared to be as, he wouldn't put it this way, I would, none of us have dared to be as optimistic as Yitzhak <laughs> Breck. Even as Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah says, yeah, you know, Israel, it's it's going to collapse. But he says, I don't say it's going to be in in." in five years or 10 years or, you know, he says, this is its fate. That's the direction it's going, but we have to be patient to have a senior Israeli general saying, look, we've got a year. I mm. mean, that may be hyperbole because he was, he's trying to shock Israeli society out of what he sees as its complacency. But on the other hand, to say such a thing when you're, you know, Israel is a country is not exactly like a bank. You know, if we think about a bank run, when rumors go out that, oh, this bank is a bit dodgy and it might fail, everyone runs to pull out their deposits and the bank fails. A, a country is more complicated than a bank because people live there, their lives are there and so on. But, you know, Israel is, there is a similar loss of confidence going mm. on. And, and that type of loss of confidence can reach a point where it's unstoppable, where mm. if you think about the tech workers now, for example, who wouldn't be trying to get out of Israel, get a job in the EU or in the United States or in Canada or somewhere else? If you look at how now, how often 
flights to Israel are canceled and for how long, all the major airlines are canceling flights into September now. And so if you're in Israel and you're thinking, well, I want to get out of here, maybe I won't be able to because you can't go by land. Where are you going to go? You can't go north to Lebanon. You're not going to go to Jordan. Uh, I mean, there are some people in Jordan who might welcome you, but not the majority of the population. Uh, you can't, you know, you're not going to go th through to Sinai. The only escape is by air. So when you start to see that the even the, the, the air links, which you've taken for granted that, oh, you can just jump on a plane from Tel Aviv to anywhere in the world, when that is no longer true and you might have to wait weeks to get a flight, or flights may be canceled or booked up months into the future, then that collapse may accelerate.